So I wanted to start off by just letting you know that this is a collaborative uh, webinar. So myself, uh, Dr. Ruth Marsek Graves and Derek Benson, as well as Natalie. And we'll just go ahead and, and start off just with a little bit about um, kind of the science of ultrasound. And ultrasound itself has become really popular tool to improve reproductive management of numerous taxa. And that includes amphibian species. So as the name implies, ultrasound uses sound waves to produce an image off of an object. Um, and sound itself is caused by tiny, fast movements that are vibrations. And these vibrations themselves kind of travel in waves from its sender to whatever its receiver is. So as sound waves travel, they transfer the energy through a medium, and that medium could be solid, it could be liquid or gas. Um, and the waves themselves can vary in size. So you can have different amplitudes. Um, so something that's a higher amplitude, of course, would be louder. And they can vary in the rate or the frequency. So if you have a high frequency, you have, of course, a higher pitch to something. Humans, uh, they can only hear frequencies of 15 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And that means the number of vibrations per second that are occurring. Now, sound waves that are greater than 20,000 hertz are what are ultrasound. So they're ultrasonic and they're not heard by humans. Um, there are numerous species that do rely on ultrasound in terms of, of their biological makeup. So like bats rely on ultrasound. Uh, for echolocation. And in terms of ultrasound itself and the technology, that's basically what we're using is something that's greater than 20,000 Hertz uh, to be able to produce the images on our machines. So the equipment itself, it's changed over time, that's for sure. And I've <laughs> witnessed that um, from ultrasounds that are extremely heavy and carrying them around. Um, to those that are now compact and pretty user friendly. Um, so in some instances, designs have are now at the point where they can be subjected to pretty harsh environmental conditions. Uh, so some are actually made for the human field in which they can be a triage dropped from a helicopter. Um, so those are ones that could be applicable for some field situations. Um, and the probe, the transducer, kind of used uh, as the same term, is kind of the piece of equipment that you yourself, the end user, is going to be paying the most attention to in terms of your application to your amphibian species. And that's going to depend on your species and also what you're wanting to, to get in the end. So in general, ultrasound probes, so the interface itself, can be linear in design. So that's kind of a straight tube. And in that case, uh, the, the production or the emission is done in a linear pattern. And that's kind of shown here where it just comes linear out of the probe versus something that's curved array or microconvex, in which we get more of a curvilinear pattern um, to the emission. So probes, when we apply those to species, uh, the transducer itself can be termed either fixed or variable. So a fixed frequency probe is going to be just one frequency itself. So it might be like a 7.5 megahertz probe. Or you could have a variable probe, one that goes over a range. So in this case, it could go 7.5 up to 10 megahertz. In general, when you have a high frequency probe, um, you have short wavelengths. So anything sound wise that's emitted is done in a short wavelength pattern and that's high frequency. Long wavelengths are associated with a low frequency probe. And just shown below is our high frequency probe is shown at the, the top. You can see that the number of waves that are occurring within a one second period of time are greater than those that are occurring with a low frequency probe. So again, we have that difference of the number of wavelengths that are occurring, whether they're short or long. In general, with amphibians, what we're looking at is high frequency, 
has a shorter penetration. So we're not able to penetrate as deep as we would be if we're looking at a low frequency probe. So for amphibians, we would be looking at, in general, high frequency probes for most of our small amphibian species. Ultrasounds themselves, here's just one located up at the top left of the corner. Um, if you have a variable probe, what you're gonna find is that you have a depth button on your machine to be able to move from one frequency to another. So in, in essence, you're moving from either being depth wise. This is a 7.5 to 10 megahertz probe. And in that case, uh, we're moving from something that is able to penetrate more deep when we see here the 4.1 centimeters versus something that's more shallow. So at 2.5 centimeters. And in this case, we're moving frequency. So we're at a lower frequency and we're able to penetrate deeper at a higher frequency, then we're not penetrating as deep. So for application wise, if we're looking at a giant salamander, we would be using a lower frequency probe than we would be when we're looking at another aquatic salamander, be it a hellbender or in this case, a nectaris. So again, we've got our little tick marks here on the side. Sometimes they're either shown on the right to the left-hand side, and they're gonna indi indicate kind of your depth that you're able to penetrate. So you can see the difference here, we've got a greater depth of penetration for the giant salamander versus that for the Nectaris species. So in terms of applying this technology, you wanna take in mind what your particular species you're wanting to see information from and determine the size or the frequency of the probe that you wanna use. So ultrasound itself, the, the terminology that tends to be used is echogenicity. And that refers to how bright something is or echogenic. And that's how bright something appears relative to another tissue. So something that's anechoic, shown over here to the left, this is a nectaris species, a female with eggs. Something that's anechoic shows up as black on the screen. So here we can see the little black circles that are located on the ultrasound machine. And that means that no eternal echoes are emitted. So the black look is with fluid filled structures. So the sound waves are gonna pass through that fluid without reflecting any echoes back to the ultrasound machine. So that gives us that black appearance that we see. Something that's hyper echoic over here to the right is a specific structure that's going to give off more echoes relative to its surrounding structures. And we get a whiter, brighter appearance. So that's what we see here with these little white dots. So these are actually eggs that were not oviposited and had undergone resorption. Hypoechoic, which is shown here with the blue circle, that's a specific structure that gives off fewer echoes relative to its surrounding structures. So it has a darker or more gray appearance relative to its surrounding tissue. In this case, we're looking at the testicles of a nectaris. So we have two testicles located here. Again, they're hypoechoic in relation to the surrounding tissue and allow us to differentiate that tissue Something that's isoechoic, that tends not to be used as frequently, it's that a specific structure gives off similar echoes relative to another. So in this case, we have a nectaris species, we have eggs that were undergoing resorption, and in that case, they had a very similar appearance, but different structure uh, to the surrounding tissue. So amphibians are kind of the perfect candidates for ultrasound. Their lack of heather, you know, hair, feather, uh, scales, it provides an ideal surface uh, for unimpaired imaging using ultrasound. 
And because to various degrees, amphibians live in aquatic environments, uh, for some species, you can use underwater scanning techniques uh, to employ that for monitoring your animals with ultrasound. So there's a variety of techniques that you can use to restrain and position animals for ultrasound. Kermie's kind of showing some of those, but the ones that we most commonly employ are shown here in some of the pictures, different species. So we have um, Necturus, we have giant salamander, we have salamanders, uh, terrestrial salamanders, as well as uh, some toad and frog species shown here. Um, and you can use sedation as a way. So in this case, we have a picture of, uh, this is a student Drew who was doing a ultrasound exam on a Necturus. And that animal was sedate because they were getting a IP injection, a hormone injection. And so ultrasound was employed at that time. Uh, but also you can have procedures done where the animal is not being sedated. Um, it's placed in a plastic container with water filled to be able to, to do uh, the ultrasound. Uh, same thing here, we have uh, somewhat of a restraint being done on a giant salamander to be able to get the probe position under them to be able to view. So we can do sedation, manual restraint, or you can place the patient in a water filled plastic container. Uh, the transducer itself can either have different contacts, so it could be a direct probe to skin contact, uh, probe to water contact, or probe to plastic content. So in some cases, um, the two plastic contents that can be used are either a plastic container like you see here with Necturus, or in some cases, individuals do use plastic bags. Um, you need to use either a coupling gel or water. You'll see when we move forward with some of the ultrasound exams that you see um, on video, water is used kind of as the coupling agent. Um, so coupling agents generally are used except in the context of if you're doing a probe to water uh, ultrasound exam. So what I'm moving on to right now is just to show you some of the strength techniques as well as also the application of ultrasound. Um, Derek Benson, who's our lead amphibian conservation keeper at Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium in our amphibian conservation area, he provided us good video footage of how he uses ultrasound, so how he conducts it and employs it to be able to do the important conservation work that this team does. And this team is under Jesse Krebs, who's the curator um, of our amphibians as well as reptiles. And Derek, along with the rest of the team, they've been responsible, as you can see here, for releasing over, well, pretty much close to 110,000 amphibians from nine different species. And Derek uses ultrasound to be able to determine which individuals will be used for breeding. So figuring out which individuals will undergo brumation or hibernation, as well as which individuals will um, need hormone protocols or which ones he will employ hormone protocols for. The two species that we're gonna look at with videos that, that Derek provided are the Puerto Rican crested toad, as well as the Wyoming toad. So this is uh, video footage of Derek uh, working with the Puerto Rican crested toad. So in this particular case, it was a female um, and he's getting her from her habitat and putting her into this plastic container to be able to take her over for the ultrasound and to conduct that. So we'll go ahead and play that video. So once she's transported over, then this is showing kind of the handling technique that he employs and the ultrasound itself. Yeah, we just position them uh, on their back and then support right behind their limbs. If it's a male, he's going to give a release call, but that way you have control of the animal and you can point uh, cloaca away from someone or away from the equipment if they do urinate. They usually relax after a while too. And that way you're not putting any pressure on organs or anything that you're trying to look at. And then we'll see the actual ultrasound exam being conducted by Derek right here for that particular female. 
because we have these people there that these aren't super ready. So this time of year, like they haven't gone into brumation and they breed in the spring. So, that's so one thing I do want to point out is, as Derek noted, we have the follicles located here, which is what you're seeing up top, lots of small follicles. And then also one of the landmark structures um, in terms of, of the toad is the, the bladder. So this fluid filled structure that you see over to the right, this long black area is the bladder. That's a good sign that I would pick her for a breeder, put her in a hibernaculum and then hopefully these would develop. So we've got him examining a male here. So for doing the ultrasound, you'll see the holding technique as well as he uses water as the coupling agent to be able to visualize. So you'll see what he's dipping into in terms of the little blue container is water. like one to me. Yeah. So they would be up against the, the back wall position like this. We then have Wyoming toads. So to kind of show this is a, a different species of toad that Derek works with, but also employs the ultrasound technology uh, to be able to determine which animals he's going to be working with for that particular year. And in this particular case, he's looking at a male Wyoming toad. So I'm just gonna mute here because I'm hearing it's a bit echoey. So in this case, he's looking, um, basically he's not seeing um, the ovarian development that you would see in a female. In addition, what he is identifying is testicles. So which seem to be one thing that he mentioned was that it is sometimes difficult in terms of if they have a fat pad. Um, so you're kind of looking around that particular area. Um, and he basically has this linear probe that's positioned under the arms uh, of the frog or the toad, I should say, sorry for that. And he was identifying testicle in this particular case. So the next species, uh, this is a salamander species. This is the blue spotted salamander. And Derek was working with a group of juvenile uh, salamanders to be able to identify the sex of the individuals. And as the case with most amphibian species, uh, females are generally easier to identify just because of that landmark ovary and follicular development, either it be small or large follicular development uh, versus males. Uh, that tends to be an area that takes more time to get attuned to that difference because in some cases it's just that density difference of the tissue. So the grayscale difference that you're differentiating. And such was the case with the blue spotted salamanders. So especially with a juvenile group and the size of those individual animals. 
So we will start this video. And in this case, Derek was showing how he will have individuals in their, their plastic container. Then he is moving them, he uses the coupling agent of water. And in this case, he tends to hold uh, between his fingers, he's got the tail kind of located so that he can keep a grip on that particular animal. And in this case, he was examining and um, just for holding technique to show that and how to use the ultrasound. So we can see here, he's got that located. You can see probe being placed on. Again, he's using a very high frequency probe. It's a small animal. So he's going to want to penetrate a shorter distance for that particular animal to get good resolution or good imaging. This next video, he moves from doing a juvenile female and identifying the ovarian development there with follicles to a male. So we'll watch that video here. So you can see he's got that tail located between his fingers so that he has a better hold on the animal. And then using water as the coupling agent to be able to visualize. You can see the follicles in one second here who have the probe back on. You can see all those follicles then that are located on that individual to be able to identify it as a female. So many immature follicles. Then he's going to be picking another animal. This particular one was a male. Uh, he had identified one male out of that batch of individuals and the rest were female. So in this case, just showing the location of the probe on the animal and where he's looking. Show that again. So again, how he's holding the, the tail between his fingers. Again, these are juvenile salamanders. So very small, high frequency probe. to identify the oocytes, being able to tell that this was a female. Again, just having to adjust if the animal's moving. So in terms of salamanders themselves and kind of what you would be looking for, um, I'm using Nectaris as a species for identifying different grades of, of follicle development. And in this case, this was a publication done in 2018. Uh, this involved three species of Nectaris. Uh, so maculosis, beira, and alabamensis. So visual inspection can be used in terms of identifying eggs in female alabamensis. They have a very translucent underside. So this was a picture that was taken. You can see the eggs in this particular female. And that's just a visual inspection. But in terms of other species of Nectaris, such as the maculosis as well as Bayeri, they don't have as translucent a skin and also just their coloration pattern. This is Bayeri, so Gulf Coast Water Dog, the spotted pattern, as well as the coloration of that particular skin. You're not able to identify that this particular female is gravid, even though she is by ultrasound. Uh, so ultrasound was employed to be able to monitor kind of their follicular development, as well as then um, utilize that to determine whether or not exogenous hormones would be used to aid in overpositioning. So the grading system that was developed is shown here. Uh, basically to the left, you see there's a grading system from zero to four and the associated reproductive status with that, as well as the description. So with grade one, it's basically non-gravid animals. So we're not able to identify eggs in those individuals. 
Grade one is early gravid, so about one to two millimeter in size. Uh, no distinct echogenic lines, so no bright white line is associated with that egg. Grade two is mid gravid, where we have eggs two to three millimeters in size. A distinct echogenic line or bright white line is associated with those. And grade three is late gravid, uh, four to five millimeters in size. Echogenic lines are still visible, and we see a marked increase in anechoic or black appearance of the egg. And grade four is retained eggs. So those that did not undergo ova positioning but had reached a grade three. We'll see varying degrees of echogenic material present in the internal egg structure. And in some cases, they can take on an amorphic shape or some may become very echogenic or bright white, and they get associated with fluid retention in the body cavity. So representative ultrasound images are shown here from the grade zero all the way up to the grade four. Uh, with Necturus, we found that the gallbladder was a very distinct marker on them to be able to know that directly caudal to that would be the gonads. Um, so here we have the the arrow is pointing to the gallbladder itself. And then we would be looking caudal to that to identify whether eggs are present or not. So in this case, we had a grade zero. Grade one is where we can see identifiable small follicles, but we don't have any of that echogenic white line. This female also had some retained eggs from the previous season. They're identified by the very hyper echogenic, small, bright circles. Grade two, we start to see those identifiable white lines associated with the fluid, all the way up to grade three, which would be our mature follicles. And then the grade four, those that are resorbed um, or those that are not ovopositioned, but undergo varying degrees of resorption. So in this case, we have ones that have a general appearance or isoechoic or very similar to the surrounding tissue, but in terms of their shape, they're very distinct. So you can tell that they are retained eggs. And then we also had a female here, in which case she had fluid retention. And that's what we see here is this dark uh, kind of fluid that's located within her, her internal cavity. So this is an ultrasound exam from a female Necturus. This was done on one where we were doing monthly exams to be able to determine uh, grading of follicles and then timing of hormone injections. For this particular female, she was at a grade three and she received an IP hormone injection of LHRH and then ovaposited, I believe five days later. And in this, you're going to see two different views. So we're looking at the animal. We have the probe place where we're taking a longitudinal view or a long view inside versus a cross-sectional view where we're crossing through and looking more at kind of like a, the, the circle or inside. So we'll see that here on this particular video. So this animal located um, within a plastic container with water so that we could use that as kind of our, our coupling agent. Here we see the nice grade three follicles. You can see all of those, the bright white echogenic lines, um, as well as the anechoic areas uh, for differentiating those particular follicles. So you can see numerous ones located here. This is a longitudinal section. So we have the probe positioned longitudinally where we're able to see kind of a long section of the animal. Here we're moving to a cross section. So we're looking at it more like a circular view that you're gonna see there. Let me get that back into view. Boop, boop, boop. We'll go to that cross sectional. Again, we're able to differentiate. We can see those individual follicles as we go through. Little circle, circle, bright white lines. So again, this is just showing cross-sectional view. So kind of those differences of taking a longitudinal versus cross-sectional view uh, to visualize inside the animal. 
So for the male, male salamanders, uh, we were able to use ultrasound to be able to differentiate testes from ovaries. Uh, again, we tend to use the gallbladder as a landmark structure in this particular species. Uh, testicles have a different density appearance, so a different gray scale appearance from the surrounding tissue. Um, and we see that here, one cross-sectional image, as well as then we have a longitudinal image, which is showing the two testicles. We also have to the right, just to show kind of how they look inside the animal. This is a necropsy on a male that had passed away. Um, so we can see the liver takes up a large portion of the, of the body cavity. We have the stomach here, and we can just see the testicles right here. So these two structures, Testicles in the Necturus are very uh, elongated. Testicle right here, kidney underneath. And then we have the landmarks here to show you a testicle, very long. Kidneys underneath, so this structure right here. And then we also have uh, the sperm duct. So that's this nice coiled tissue that you see here. But again, just kind of helpful to see translating what you're seeing on ultrasound to kind of what they look like inside the animal. This is an ultrasound exam of a Gulf Coast water dog or Necturus bayeri. This is a male. Um, and this exam here, again, done in a plastic container. We're gonna look for kind of our landmark gallbladder, and then we start to see the testicles appear over here to the right of the screen, just how the probe is positioned. So we've got one, two. So again, just that slight difference in grayscale image, you're able to see the two testicles there. So I kind of have it frozen at this point, kind of highlighting one testicle and then the other. Again, Males tend to be like over time and repetition, just getting your eye trained for looking at that difference in the grayscale. Also, the lack of any follicles <laughs> is kind of the default for um, sexing um, most of the amphibian species. Go to the end. And next. And then I'm going to be handing this over now to Natalie, so she can be able to talk um, and take you guys through the rest of the, the case studies um, for this particular talk. Thanks, Monica. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I need to caveat too that the case study that I'm presenting to you is actually a case study that was uh, carried out by Ruth Marsek, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. So I'm gonna do my best to give you the, um, the rundown of what the study was and, and her, um, her results for that. Um, her model species for this was Ambistoma tigrinum. Um, uh, and so in that, I, I should tell you that the, the basis of this study was actually to try and link ultrasound, the use of ultrasound and the grading system to the development of a hormone protocol for animals that were at different stages of ovarian development. Um, next slide. Can you, yeah, thanks. Um, so what, Ro, uh, what Ruth, Ruth did with this study was she actually um, devised a long, short, and mid, a long, middle, and short treatment for animals, depending on what grading system they were at. And here, obviously, we can look at the the different hormones that she used: um, HCG and an LHRH with an ovulatory LHRH HCG combination. In the long treatments, these these were the long treatment is basically going to be aimed at animals that were classified under the grading one system. Um, and then obviously the middle would be two and the short would be three. Um, I can't exactly tell you right now why she did the time frames that she did. And so I'm sure she'd be happy to answer any of questions relating to how she came up with that strategy. But Basically what happened was with the, with animals that showed a grade one system, um, definitely 
there was um, the forethought there is that because they're at a, at a earlier stage of development, then in actual fact, this exogenous hormone treatment needs to be designed over time to sort of elicit um, pushing that development forward in order to, to be able to cause these animals to overposit. Next slide. So the results, the bulk of the results of her treatments were as follows. Um, with animals that were early stages of ovarian development, what she found was that in actual fact, the percentage of animals that would respond to any kind of hormone treatment was, was significantly lower to, to those obviously as to be expected that were further along, naturally further along. However, what she found was that with animals that were a grade one, there's going to be a requirement of at least two to three priming doses. And now in past um, talks, we've heard from other people such as Amy Silla um, and Leah uh, and myself and uh, Gina De La Sonia that actually these priming doses are used to sort of push those, those natural hormone uh, fluctuations along and, and elicit what we what we need from the animal in order to to cause other position, which is actually pushing the the surge of LH um, along. The priming doses in the case of the grade one animals um, with two priming doses, she Ruth found a sixteen about a sixteen seventeen percent response leading to overposition. But definitely with three priming doses, that seemed to then double in the amount to 33%. However, from this, from this um, study, you can see that actually grade one is probably just indicative of the animal not being ready. And so whether uh, a continued uh, long process of priming would be required is, is obviously um, up for, for further investigation. As we go further down to the grade three and the grade three, uh, grade two and grade three animals, as you can see, the chances of overposition increase um, with with exogenous treat, like hormone treatment, but it further increases in the grade two animals if you if you administer um, three primes and an ovulatory dose um, in in addition to that, leading up to about eighty three percent overposition rate. In those animals, but still not a bad response at 67% with the short and medium. So that also kind of shows you the variability of individuals um, and their their ability or their response to exogenous hormone treatments, which again is something to to really have in mind in terms of uh, thinking about what your individuals would do, what the history of the of the ex each individual is and how many times or what the breeding history for that individual is, how many times those females have bred in the past um, and what that, what that history is for each female. In the grade threes, obviously, I mean, it, it goes without saying um, that all of the animals responded to, to the hormone treatment. Next slide. So, the conclusion of that obviously is that if you do have a grade one and you feel like you, you want to try and elicit that overposition, that you are probably going to have to design a strategy that requires one, two, three, multiple priming um, uh, doses before you actually administer an ovulatory dose. And again, that's going to be species and individual specific. So that's going to require some time to actually develop, but at least with the ultrasound, you know where you're starting. And so you can actually cater your exogenous hormone treatments to individuals within your captive colony. Next slide, please. Again, with the two, this is just a summary um, to break it up and make it a little bit clearer, but basically with grade two, what she found was that actually three primes was, um, was definitely a good strategy for eliciting that overposition. Those, the medium and the short actually panned out to be pretty much the same in terms of their, their response. Great, um, next slide. Please. So with grade three, um, sorry, I actually meant to highlight the short, not the long um, ovulatory dose there. So where I've squared in yellow, I actually meant to put it up, yeah, up the top. Basically in this case, what she showed was that a short ovulatory was single dose was enough. And given that there was 
no difference in in how these animals responded, then you know the recommendation there would be actually to use the minimal amount of hormones, right? So in the case of her of Ruth, she would she would have highlighted um, the short ovulatory dose only as as a strategy for inducing ovulation in these animals. Next slide. So again, so just to sum that up, um, where possible for, and obviously uh, for ease of, of your protocols and, I, uh, and in, in conjunction with you know, treating the animals in the best welfare possible, the use of um, a single ovulatory dose for a grazing animal in this species is probably what would be recommended um, in order to induce a position. If a female displays a lower grade of ovarian development, then obviously you would adjust that, that those protocols to, to include uh, one, two, or even three priming, priming doses before the ovulatory dose. But again, I think it's good to highlight that that is dependent on whether your ultimate goal is to breed specific individuals within every given any given year with the specific idea of cert having certain management considerations at play. So if there's an individual in particular that you feel like needs to breed that year in order, in order to adjust your genetics within the colony or because you have a certain reintroduction protocol that you're, you're trying to stick to, then sure, I think that administering um, catering those protocols to those animals is, is justifiable. Um, however, if there's no rush in, in, in all essence, then you know, it would be at least my recommendation to just hold back and let those animals kind of progress naturally unless you have specific things that you wanna do. Um, obviously then this case study kind of just brings a very pilot study um, to, to you in showing that ultrasound can help you determine and cater very specifically to not only your species, but the individuals within your, um, your captive colonies in order to try and optimize breeding strategies for in any given year. Um, but there are also other tools that are becoming a little bit more available um, in time. And, and I'll certainly touch on that in a second. Next slide. So Monica spoke a little bit about salamander um, ultrasound and really uh, in the frog species that I have worked in uh, the most, which is the Mount Yellow frog, Rhino muscosa, uh, the basic pr principles that she, she spoke about apply. We also have a grade one, two, and three. Obviously the grade zero, as she mentioned, would be you know an absence of follicular development. And yes, our grade four is also um, females that show egg retention. Um, I didn't include them here. On the underneath the picture of of the frog, you can see basically an ovary that is this is after a breeding event that year, and so basically the ovary looks essentially empty, um, with you know very few or if not 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 very visible follicular development um, still under play. Grade one, um, as you can see above, uh, and again, the yellow arrows point to the structures that Monica has elicited to earlier, um, is basically, again, in this species would start to be apparent probably in early fall, um, late summer to early fall, when animals begin their ovarian development again in the lead up to brumation or overwintering. And grade two is variable, but you see this either during the brumation period or um, coming out of brumation. So stage two, grade two is, is at least indicative that your females are gonna be ready for breeding that year. Um, and grade three obviously also um, is pretty clear as to, as to these females um, being ready to breed. Next slide. So the other interesting thing that has come out of using ultrasound for us with this species is twofold. One is, as Monica mentioned, egg retention and the, this phenomenon that is 
widely reported sort of a neg um, in the, uh, at least in captive populations anyway. Um, as you can see from the first picture on the left, um, and Monica spoke about this, there's a high degree of fluid retention within there and the structures of what would have been eggs kind of having that amorphic um, morphology to them as they begin to essentially decompose and break down. Um, on the right side is a, sort of an ovary that shows a little bit more of a stage where the egg may have, we, we were assuming at the time, because we obviously couldn't open the animal up to see, but be undergoing egg uh, reabsorption um, into the system. Now, not all of these females in this species actually undergo reabsorption, as Monica elicited alluded to earlier, a lot of these females, and this one in particular, um, we dubbed her fatty, always had um, over consecutive years, always overposited both a, a portion of old eggs from the year previously that had been unreleased in at the same time as, as her fresh eggs. And so quite often her her fecundity was low due to the fact that you know her clutches were this mix of, of old and, and new eggs. Um, with this female, we had several years where a lack of overposition and these structures, um, these breakdowns occurred. And so in one year, we actually went in and did perform surgery to remove, um, essentially remove these eggs. Um, this female recovered Fine from this, she was anesthetized. Um, the surgery performed by vets at San Diego um, Zoo Safari Park Animal Hospital, and uh, yeah, she recovered pretty well. And so, actually, removing those structures is, is not hard, but it's definitely um, not recommendable. And so, in these cases, sometimes what we can do is also employ exogenous hormones to try and push that overposition um, to occur if it's not happening naturally. Next slide, please. In this last slide, um, the other phenomenon that we um, kind of discovered by accident was, um, and has been reported um, recently by Jack Jacob et al, is the is hermaphrodite, hermaphroditism um, in this species. Uh, the founding population uh, of frogs for this species was was the captive population was started with uh, egg masses and some tadpoles that were found and salvaged from after a post of fire events in, Cal in Southern California. And they were brought into captivity and have been used as the, as the, breeding, um, the breeding colony for the recovery of this species, which is still ongoing. And what we noticed is after about 10 or 11 years in captivity, so with very, very mature females, that some of the females started displaying amplectic behaviors during the breeding season and um, apparently started developing some pads or nuptial pads um, more specifically. And when we looked at the ultrasound of these animals, and these animals are in this slide, you can see are labeled NPF, which we call the nuptial pad females. And we compared them to um, other breeding females, you can see from the structure in the ultrasound that in actual fact, there is no apparent follicular development there. And in actual fact, the ovary looks a lot like that other slide that I showed you where it just looks post-reproductive, like nothing was happening. If you compare it to the males, it was kind of a similar, there was similar structures happening in, in the background too. Interestingly enough, we had the chance to um, collect some um, blood from these animals and perform mass spectrometry on a variety of hormones. In this slide, I'm basically just showing you estradiol, estriol, and testosterone, which were the three sort of more telling hormones. Um, and what we found was that the nuptial pad females actually were displaying hormone levels that were more uh, that were more male. Um, characteristic of male um, levels than actual females. And when we started, when these, as these animals started to die off, and we, we performed the necropsies on them uh, sort of opportunistically, what actually came about was that most of these females were hermaphrodites. 
I should also say that out of five out of these seven females had had a breeding history and so had actually contributed to the colony as females. One later also um, was classified as having contributed as a male. And so this is quite an interesting phenomenon. Obviously, um, it's important that we report this because when we're actually using these animals as, you know, our sort of captive reproducers for the re reintroductions or the recovery of the species, it's important to be able to actually identify these structures and know what's happening with these animals so that you're not trying to breed animals that are either past the reproductive um, age or that you are aware that in some cases some amphibian species can display the, these hermaphroditic characteristics and that maybe your protocols may not actually be working not because they don't work but actually because you have you know, um, there are actual other factors at play um, that are you know interfering with with their development protocols and it is, I should also say that a lot of these females underwent um, exogenous hormones for ovulation in 2014, and many of them didn't respond as we had thought. Um, and when we looked at the controls, they, there was no specific difference with laying um, after exogenous hormone treatment. Of course, now we know with the benefit of hindsight and in, in using ultrasound and our hormone analysis that of course, there's probably a very good reason why they didn't respond the way we thought they should respond to this. So again, this is something that ultrasound has very much helped with um, and is you know, now part of our um, San Diego Zoo's practices in terms of, of this species. And we do obviously yearly and monthly monitoring with that as well. As Monica suggested, Derek is also doing that with his species and actually is really important in, in managing and doing everyday husbandry for, for amphibians. So we, we have external partners, uh, USGS, um, also California Fish and Wildlife, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and obviously Southern California Forest Depart Forestry Department. They were also all involved. Um, clearly Monica and Derek in Omaha, so thank you so much to you guys as well, and Ruth as well, um, for all of her input. 